Good afternoon and welcome to the final services breakout session of our BI Day. My name is Päivi Karesjoki and I am your host and guide today in this breakout session. I'm working uh, as a data and AI advisor at Capgemini. And I have the privilege to work more than 30 years with financial services organizations. And along these years, I have seen how the use of the data has changed from the transactional processing and the compliance need to more to be like customer first and cloud first. Today, uh, we have picked you four very important trends and hot topics that based on Capgemini Research Institute are important to you. We picked those trends based on what the customers are saying is the highest priority for adaption, as well as when adapted, they will have the highest impact on the business. Of course, among these is AI. All the research are saying that AI will affect all industries. But interesting is that the mm, research as well says that the most impact will be in financial services. The estimate is even 30% growth improvement in the productivity. But it's not only to improve the productivity, it's as well the customer services. We customers, either individuals or organizations, are demanding much more tailored services and innovative products. And AI can help there. Some of these trends have been on the top list many years, but they are evolving. A few years ago, uh, all the people were asking, why should I move to cloud? Now the question is more, how quick, quickly I can move to cloud? The cloud is not only the new place of storing your data or running your applications, it's much more. That enables you to enlist the value of the data with the new emerging technologies. But it as well will change our way of thinking and working. And today we have a concrete examples how this has affected and, and been done. The fourth topic we have selected is the sustainability. The sustainability should be in everybody, everybody's agenda. And the financial services has a very important role there because you are financing and investing in the companies who actually then can really change the world. But it's not easy. The ESG regulation is complex. You have to navigate in this ESG jungle and we will as well have a concrete example with a tool who help you in there. Let's now zoom in to these topics in more detail and how to make it real. I welcome our first guest, Errol Kuhlmeister, who is an AI and technology advisor and has been successfully implemented the AI capabilities for multiple companies, especially in the banking industry, and to get value out of AI. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pevi. And it's an absolute pleasure being here today talking about applying generative AI for real in financial services. But before we get started and deep diving, let us just establish one thing. Everything has changed. The changes we have seen the last 12 months, both in terms of interest, but also in implications of generative AI, has completely changed the marketplace. So what is really the difference? Well, the difference in all of this is traditional machine learning models versus foundational models. And we needed to build a model for each task. So we had potentially images of cars or pictures, etc. We needed to label them, create a model and then a prediction. This took time. But with the implementation now of generative AI, we're moving away from a single model for every particular project we are using foundational models. That means we get a lot of data, a lot of intelligence in these foundational models that can create predictions. We don't need the same scale or complexity as we did before. We also know to build on what Pavey was talking about, that this is fundamentally changing the banking industry. We can see that this is around top three on industries in some sort of economical impact. This is important. But it's not just important in the terms of economical impact. It's also important in terms of competition. When we look on the market, and now we're going to zoom down on the Nordic market a little bit in particular, benchmarking how organizations actually are using or are they using, 
we see that the Nordic market is still relatively, or I would say very immature. We only have two Nordic banks being placed in the top 50 banks applying and getting value out of AI. So the potential is very, very big. This means that this is no longer a hygiene factor. It, it, well, it is a hygiene factor, it's not a competitive edge any longer. If you're not doing AI, that means you're lagging behind the competition. What we know and what we need to consider in the financial services is where are we coming from? Banking, traditionally, has been data-driven quite early on. I mean, let's face it, there's a lot of data and we make calculated investments based on the risks. But we did so very early in the financial industry. That means that there is a lot of legacy, legacy hanging around that we need to deal with. There's a large workforce. There's a lot of processes. And of course, who can talk about banking and financial services without mentioning the regulatory environment that we are in? That makes it quite hard for us to focus on the latest and greatest because there's so many considerations, so much analysis, and then it's the risk we need to manage. So when we talk about generative AI, where are we focusing on? So I've been doing quite many use cases. So let's have an overlook over the LLM landscape. When we look on LinkedIn, we look on social media, there's a lot of discussions today around, oh, we're doing generative AI. However, what we tend to notice is it's primarily kind of low level technology. Well, not the technology in itself, but it's open AI. People are writing prompts. There's prompt engineering. We're seeing marketing use cases. Those kind of things, we're really not fooling the full potential of this. When we go towards the right in the complexity setup, if we need to set this up in the enterprise environment, we can all of a sudden start leveraging enterprise data within the LLM landscape. All of a sudden, we can start looking at all of our legal documents, the customer data, if we're managing this securely. We can start using technologies that we have more control over, which also means that we can start expanding the use cases. And this is what we want to get to. Because end of the day, we are probably not going to spend a lot of money into researching new models. The things that we want to do is using what others have already invented. When we have done an overview over the market, of course, OpenAI, Google are the ones that are most visible out there. However, there is a large plethora of open source large language models as well. Combining them with your own data, managing the infrastructure, all of a sudden start making sense. You're not going to develop your own LLMs because you don't have that data. But what we start seeing is the real enterprise opportunity in the financial service industries lies somewhere in between the easy use cases, the marketing campaigns, no customer data, no internal setup, versus building your own models. So being somewhere in the middle, connecting it to your own already existing data sources, that's where the gold is. And that's what we want to get to. The last 12 months, I've been quite heavily involved in running different use cases. And a set of use cases you see in front of you right now should probably not be any strangers because a lot of organizations have compiled them, made them into lists. But I want to be a little bit more specific. The last 12 months, we put about 10 different large-scale use cases in the financial industry. And what we start seeing is really the value we are getting out of this. When we apply it, for instance, in risk management, and when I mean risk management, it's about analyzing the large amount of legal documentations. All of a sudden, you get a better understanding of your internal compliance risks. So that's a really good use cases, and it saves a lot of man hours, provides accurate answers, and you can even get reference to the documents, so you can actually start understanding where this information comes from in the large language models. In addition to that, applying it on processes, which today are quite hard to automate. For instance, one of those topics could be loans processing. If you want to analyze the amount of loans going through, and you want to make sure that the handlers of those credits uh, are doing the right decisions, an LLM can quite easily go in and analyze all of those processes. 
in addition to that, when there is a lot of data, for instance, speech to text data, let's take a customer call center. What we have seen is when you apply this to the audio files, all of a sudden you can take several of the use case boxes. So you can reuse the investments that you're making. You can use it, for instance, for customer churn prevention, have some sort of contact center assistance, removing a lot of manual workloads. And remember, that's one of the things where we see major benefits into all of this. So end of the day, it is about understanding your different use cases. And since this is banking and financial services, we need to think pragmatically. What I want to do now that we're moving away a little bit from the use cases as well, is understand how you practically can do this in your organization. As I said, we've set up about 10 of them large scale. One of my learnings from the way of what we need to work with when it comes to machine learning, generative AI, is how can we move faster? And more explicitly, how can we move faster in a regulated environment? What we came up with in order to do this is manage the infrastructure ourselves. It was very hard when we were dependent on an external party to set up and manage the infrastructure because we wanted to have control. OpenAI, for instance, it required us to have a lot of trust within Microsoft. And Microsoft is really good in several components, but it's about building this trust over time as well. So what we came up with in order for us to make several use cases was that we started building our own infrastructure components. Now when we are doing new use cases with generative AIs, it takes us two to three weeks because we create a reusability in all of the different components. The first thing we set up was a compute orchestration layer because these LLM, they require quite a lot of computing power. And it's quite expensive to do this on cloud. So what we have started seeing is actually a lot of the financial industries and other industries as well moving back to on-prem to get cost and manage it a little bit more. And also there are different computational needs that you want to be able to scale up and down depending on the amount of use cases you're doing. After this computational orchestration layer, we needed to orchestrate the complexity be below doing generative AI. Doing that required us to create modular components, Lego bricks, that we could manage and reuse for every new use case. In addition to that, we started treating every large language model as a separate component that we could easily change within this orchestration layer. All of a sudden, we were not dependent on open AI models or Google models or even the open source model. They were interchangeable. We could pick slimmer one or larger one. We had information retrieval with ROGs. We had fine tuning as separate components. On top of that, we had sort of a serving layer as well because we really believe in the future of having sort of an app store with slim applications that you build rapidly for your organization and then integrate with. So having small applets that you can either through a user interface communicate with or through APIs, but you can rapidly create this on enterprise data, orchestrate it and deploy it in a matter of weeks, not months, because the market is really moving so fast. So the flexibility and the speed is a key success factor when it comes to applying generative AI for real in the financial industry. However, this on itself doesn't provide much value. This is not connecting it to the enterprise data. On top of that, you need a service integration layer towards your legacy infrastructure. Remember, uh, financial services have a lot of legacy IT. So if you can connect that without moving everything, you're saving a lot of time and you can modernize the legacy IT along those lines as well. Because modernizing legacy IT is going to take time, but the market is still going to keep on moving. So this is our approach to utilizing the data that is in there. If you built a data lake, you connect it up. If you have Jira, if you have Confluence, those can be treated as data sources. And then you can rapidly deploy new generative AI application. As soon as something new comes to the market, you can plug it in, or you can start building new use cases as you go along. So that's the approach we have seen so far that has been the most successful in creating a faster speed to market in the industry. 
But let's get real then. What we don't want to do if we start summarizing all of these learnings so far and applying these things is this needs to come from the top. It is very hard to get traction from the organization unless there is high stakeholder uh, involvement in this topic. It needs to be a C-level decision that you are comfortable with doing these things. Otherwise, it will be sporadic projects here and there. We need to treat it as a data science project, but we don't need to be dependent on the data science because this type of development is actually more engineering heavy but we require it to be very agile in the way we deploy and build these topics. Data science is iterative because all models are wrong, some are helpful. What you want to do as well is have specialized model for each target that you're doing. OpenAI is a large generative model. It's going to provide you good results in the majority of cases, but it's also going to be more expensive. There are smaller ones get to know what's on the market. The open source models are actually quite good with all of these things. We urge organizations to try and get things out there. Don't go to POCs, go directly to production in quick iterations with your stakeholders and build on top of that. Ensure there is a compliance and governance framework in place, that's actually one of the most important things, if you're using internal data sources. Connect it up with authentication so only authorized users can access the correct data in all of these topics as well. What you shouldn't do is to trust the models 100%. Because these generative AI models, they, they don't always provide accurate answers. There are governance and techniques to get around that, like references, but don't trust it 100%. What is really important here is the flexibility and the rapid deployment opportunity that you can have. What we realized is this is a time of change and the market is moving so first. The ChatGPT Model 3 was released two years ago now in December, well, 2022. Then six months later, we get ChatGPT or GPT-4, six months in between. The market is moving so extremely fast. So dare to dream big, but focus on delivering value. Don't build a platform that's going to take three years until you're done with it. Deliver value tomorrow. And then iterate towards a sustainable business progress in your financial industry. Thank you. Thank you, Errol, so much for sharing your experience of Chain AI. I can easily share the productivity increase uh, percentages. But something that many customers ask me is, can you really trust Gen AI results? How reliable they are? So what I always do when I get this question, because it's a good question is, can we trust humans? In financial services, we know that there's double controls, there's governance frameworks, there are rules and regulations. That's why I say, treat the AI the same way as we treat human decision-making today in regulated industries, control and governance. Thank you. Thank you. And let's continue with our program. It's not all about technology, like I, I mentioned. It's all about way of working and thinking and, and from old to new. May I welcome uh, Sony from EQT? You. And you are going to tell us, how do you take your journey towards the data democratization? Yes, thank you, baby. Uh, so, uh, I will talk about uh, how we went from a data monolith towards a data mesh organization. Uh, my name is Jon Reichwald, I come from EQT and I'm an analytics lead there. Uh, so, what's EQT? We are a global private equity company founded in Sweden. Uh, and what we do, we, we raise money from investors. We buy companies, uh, we hold the companies for a couple of years, and hopefully we can sell them at a profit later on. Uh, for the last four years, we have been through a fantastic growth journey. Uh, our assets under management has grown by 240%, and our uh, num number of employees has grown by 190%. Uh, what you see here on the screen is uh, in, the, in the background is our investor portal. It is where our investors can go in and uh, see how their investments are performing. 
so how did we end up with the data monolith to begin with? Uh, in, in the beginning, in 2019, uh, we started out uh, very small and uh, we were only three people. Uh, and the first 20 SQL models were committed to our DBT repo. Uh, and if we fast forward a little bit, in April 2019, we published our first Power BI report. Uh, and uh, we were then uh, growing. We were 10 people in, in the beginning of 2020. Uh, we started integrating with Slack and so on. Fast forward a little bit. Uh, we published even more financial reports. Uh, and uh, the team slowly grew, grew. And if you look, uh, May 2020, we were up to 500 models, which is quite a lot. Still only 14 people. And then we went live with our first uh, customer-facing product, the Investor Portal, which you saw in the previous screen. Uh, and then, if we fast forward even further, in one, one year ago, in January 2023, we had almost 2,400 models. And we had 63 contributors in our repository, which uh, makes it uh, a bit hard to manage. And uh, from being a very small team that just organically grew, it became uh, very hard to know where to find the data. Uh, and uh, qu qu quite difficult in, in many aspects. Uh, but at the same time, we served over 40 Power BI models, um, both financial reporting and forecasting models. Um, uh, and, and we had a lot of integrations to external and in, internal systems. So, to summarize, our data solution had proven to be a huge success, uh, but the sheer size of it had became, become a problem. So, then we had to sit down and think really hard, what do we need to do now? Uh, so, our diagnosis was something along the lines, the patient is taking a turn to the worse, what do we do? So, despite the success of our data platform, uh, we couldn't really answer all the fundamental questions, like how many FTEs do we have? How many uh, companies do we own to 100% and so on? Uh, and equitarians didn't have ready-made uh, data sets that they could use for, for this. Uh, and also, we lacked a bit in the area of uh, common definitions of data. Numbers could look slightly different depending on which report you're looking at. Uh, and this relates very much to governance that I know Eric will talk a bit more about in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, at, at the same time, the need for analytics was only growing. So we sat down, fought really hard for a while, and uh, we decided to shift to a new data strategy. We needed to move from perfection, pixel-perfect reports, to more of a continuous improvement model. Uh, also, we needed to move from a centrally managed data repository to a more federated data mesh. And with that goes also that we need to move from a central data team ownership to a domain ownership. Uh, and also, uh, we want to shift away from, from bespoke reporting, rebuilding everything from scratch each, each time we want to do something. Uh, so how can we do that? Can we make people go more of a self-service route, gi given that we have these data products that we wanted to build? So based on this new data strategy, we decided we want to build a data mesh. Uh, and uh, this is something you can read more about. Uh, there is a lot of literature on it. Uh, but in our instance, it looked, looked uh, like this. Uh, in the center, we have the domains. Those are the ones that are building the data products and the data contracts that, that can be consumed by others. Uh, supporting the domains, we have uh, enabling teams. We have a platform team looking at the tools and, and the infrastructure for developers. We have an analytics team that uh, are more looking at the end user experience and the self-service parts. Uh, we have a site reliability engineering team looking at logging and, and uh, such. And at the top, you can see something called data leads. The data leads is not a team in itself, but it consists of members of all of the other teams. And they are responsible for 
coordinating and setting a strategy and, and making things t come together, making sure that everyone is talking to each other. Uh, so we have our domains that are responsible for building data products. So what is a data product then? It is a curated data set that has approved metadata associated with it uh, that can answer some specific question, like if you have an HR data product, it can answer how many FTEs do you have. Uh, and uh, the idea with this, and, and the real power comes from when you start thinking about, okay, we have the HR data uh, product, but then we also might have a fund data product telling us our assets under management. And by having common dimensions in our data products, we can start combining them. We can divide the FDE count with uh, assets under management. And then we can say, are we growing our headcount at the, uh, the same amount or, or less than, than we're growing our assets under management? And that, that's uh, where the real power comes into the picture. And by making sure that you have the same dimensionality between all of your data sets, uh, this becomes really, really powerful. And uh, I've tried to illustrate it here. Uh, it is uh, obviously very simplified, but uh, I'm trying to make a point here. Uh, over time, with the old way of doing, we built bespoke reports and uh, the support and maintenance burden just grew over time, so our productivity kind of plateaued. With the data products, the more you add, the more power you get over time. Uh, so where are we today then? Uh, we have actually split out uh, a couple of our domains from our central repository. Uh, and uh, the data products in our data catalog, the number of them is growing and we're slowly replacing uh, our, our um, reports with the, with the new model. So we, we are st still, uh, we, we have s s some things st still to do, but we're, we're, we're making good progress. Uh, and a big learning from, from this process has been, it's, it's more about people and technology, tying into what Errol said also. Uh, it's super important to have buy-in from the business, otherwise you'll get stuck very quickly. Uh, it's also important to avoid new silos. Um, you, you need to create communication channels and forums for people to discuss and have a relaxed environment. Uh, another thing is that it's, quite hard to bootstrap until you get across the hurdle for, for being productive with a new approach with data products. Uh, and you need a concentrated effort to, to push the organization across that. Uh, and that also, of course, ties into the buy-in that you need from the business. You need some patience and, and uh, management uh, buy-in. Uh, and if you look at the success factors, what made it really great. I think the data leads was a very important point. Coordinating, making sure we're not silofications everything again. Uh, also keeping a focus. It's hard, it's easy to get distracted and uh, having uh, uh, competing objectives, tr trying uh, to do a lot of things at the same time. Uh, the data contracts that makes it easy to consume the data products. And also this shared dimensionality that I mentioned earlier is super important because otherwise you cannot combine the, the, the new data products. And looking uh, back, I, I think the biggest wins so far has been that we have these new domains uh, that are focusing purely on the business objectives with the supporting teams taking care of all the platform parts and technology, te technological uh, tooling parts. Uh, which increases the accuracy and, and also the time to delivery. Uh, and the, the second most important part, I would say, is the data products, because the combinatorial power of this is super powerful. And having them reusable and having them discoverable, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's super good. So uh, with that, I would like to thank you.
Thank you, Johnny. What an impressive journey you have done. Indeed. I learned in this presentation that it's not only AI who makes the productivity, it's a data product as well. Yes. <laughs> and, and just to add to that, in, in, uh, in our domain, in financial services, of course, uh, we, we cannot have generative mm. uh, models for, for the financial data because mm. in the end, mm. it, it, every cent counts. We can't have... But I would like to have a, one or maybe two questions. What was the most difficult and what was the easiest part of your journey? Going into this, we were thinking, oh, it will be super hard to break out uh, the repos into several parts and so on. But surprisingly, that went quite smooth. So it, it's more the, the people aspect, I would say, and, and making sure that you really have a buy-in from all levels of the organization. Because without that, you, you, you will get stuck very, very quickly. Thank you, and enjoy your, your, your outcome of the data Thank products in the future. Now we are midway in our uh, breakout session. We have learned the generative AI uh, effectivity uh, improvements. Uh, we have learned how to move from old to new with a new way of thinking and, and working with data products. Uh, the champions and winners in financial services can combine data, AI, people and technology. Now I would like to invite our partner Databricks to guide us through how we can combine this all with a good governance, as well as to give us a customer journey with fraud detection. Thank you, Pevi. Hi, everyone. I'm here to share what we have learned from our 6,000 customers around the world, and specifically the ones in the financial sector. Um, I lead our professional services for Databricks in the Nordics and have a background in consulting, analytics delivery and data engineering management. Um, I've been with Databricks as a partner, a vendor and also as a customer and I'll draw from all three of these perspectives in my session today. So in these times of geopolitical instability and financial uncertainty, there's a lot of challenges in this sector. Uh, we'll hone in on the one specifically for data and AI today. Uh, we see three areas. First one is data quality and integration. So financial sector is faced with inconsistent data and um, a variety of different types of data, making it very difficult to aggregate and analyze. There's also lots of legacy systems in the financial sector. An integration between legacy systems and modern technologies can be very resource intense and complex. Secondly, um, regulatory compliance, data privacy and cybersecurity are challenges, external factors uh, that causes problems for the financial sector. We see a myriad of different uh, regulations that the financial sector needs to comply with. It can be everything from GDPR to MIFID 2 to Basel 3, which makes strict regulations on how you can handle data, around data privacy and security. Also, the financial sector collects and stores vast amounts of uh, sensitive information, and that makes them prime targets for cyber attacks. Thirdly, the skill gap and talent acquisition. So the cloud space is moving at a very high pace and making, you know, staying on top of the best practices and the new features is, is difficult. And we see a significant skill gap also in the, in the people that have a knowledge around the financial sector and also around um, data and AI technologies. And as our customer Stefan Groth at uh, ABN AMRO put it, in order to capitalize on the opportunity in front of us, we needed, to, we needed the ability to harness the data at our disposal and work in a completely different way than we're used to. So let's look at how, what companies do to overcome these challenges. So first, technology is an enabler. And um, it's not the competitive advantage. The competitive advantage comes for how you leverage the technology in your organization. We have identified three key success factors for companies that are successful in this space. First, it's an intense 
focus on value. In the financial sector, the investments in the journey to cloud and data and AI is, is bubbling. And um, we see that the ability to realize value in this space comes from focus. You need to not try to solve all the problems, but to focus on the things that are the most important and can move the needle for you. The best companies also do things. They, just, they, they don't stop at planning or talking about it. Um, and we can see, as, as Errol uh, pointed out in his, in his presentation, that companies are now leveraging generative AI to make the move from the legacy systems onto cloud via translating old code, Cobalt and so on, to English to understand the business logic and then move on to translate it over to, to Python or a modern language, which simplifies the process, right, and makes the makes the customer understand what they, what they have. Secondly, they build strong data governance and data management capabilities. And this is key when they're scaling fast in a sector which is under regulatory pressure. And as Jonny talked about on EQT, to build data products and manage data domain, you need to have a strong data governance capability within your organization. And we see the successful companies First of all, having a C-suit sponsorship with their transformations towards becoming more digitalized, more data-driven. And we also see them build strong data governance and data management capabilities. Thirdly, unification. So the benefits of centralization of core aspects of data is compounding over time. That can be around talent, operational costs going down as you sort of centralize your capabilities. It's also a way of breaking silos, fostering collaboration between different capabilities within the company and different teams. Um, and an important thing we have seen is that companies create a pull towards the, the common capabilities and the common platforms, right? And this requires significant change management, so don't underestimate that piece of it. We also see that successful companies establish some sort of center of excellence where they engage both their internal uh, people and resources, as well as vendors and partners into this. And they demand that their partners and vendors have skin in the game in the journey. We will look at how all these things come together. Josh will show us a demo on how we um, leverage these capabilities in a sort of more complex analysis of uh, fraud detection. Exactly, Please, yes. George. Thank you very much, Eric. So, Fraud detection, it's a super important subject for many financial services companies, banks, uh, credit card issuers, but it's also relevant to other companies um, who might be doing things like uh, abuse detection on their platforms. And so in this demo, I'm going to show you how you can very easily incorporate uh, geospatial elements into the fraud detection uh, capabilities using the tools that we provide at Databricks. Um, this is going to allow you to get up and running very, very quickly. Um, and I think it's also really important to highlight that this is just one aspect um, of the fraud detection process. Okay, so we're going to be focusing on geospatial, but there's also you know, a broader spectrum of, of multimodal approaches we can do, so incorporating things like times of transactions uh, and other aspects. But uh, if we look at the, at the diagram here, so in this demo, I'm going to show you how we can incorporate a geospatial element into fraud detection. Um, we're going to use the tools that are built into Databricks, and this is going to help you get up to speed really quickly um, and start delivering value to the business through improved fraud detection accuracy. So as you can see in this diagram, uh, Databricks is really providing an end-to-end -end solution. So starting with ingesting the card transaction data from the source systems, um, moving through the process of doing the ETL, um, model uh, data exploration, model building, all the way through to the model deployment phase. Um, and by having this unified approach on the platform, this really fosters uh, collaboration between uh, the different disciplines involved. So software engineers, we've also got uh, data engineers, data scientists, and even business analysts involved. So let's look at the details of the actual uh, demo here. Um, so we have two tasks ahead of us. The first is going to be to actually uh, cluster the data together. So we've got some transaction data that's been enriched with latitude and longitude. We need to cluster that together. And then the second is going to be using those clusterings to actually identify um, outliers, uh, which could be potentially fraud fraudulent transactions. 
And a really important thing to highlight is that we're just using uh, one aspect of the data here. Okay, so we're looking at just at the, the geospatial aspect. In reality, we would have a multimodal approach. We might also incorporate things like um, the the time of the transaction or also the vendor type and things like that. So here we're going to be using. Uh, Density-based spatial clustering is a great approach. We don't need to specify the size of the clusters or the number of clusters ahead of time, but it does have one major drawback, which is by default, we need to compare every single point in the data set with every other point in the data set. So this can be quite a drawback. Um, so what we're going to do to improve that um, is make use of Uber's H3 library, which essentially allows us to group data together into polygons across the, wo the world's surface. Um, and by doing this, we can actually take a first pass of the data and group the different latitudes and longitudes into these clusters. Um, and this allows us to do th two things. The first is actually parallelize our process, but it also allows us uh, to avoid needing to compare between every single point in the data set. Instead, we can just compare within those groups. So once we have, the, have those groupings, we can actually start to cluster within those. And we're going to use a regular graph algorithm called connected components, which will, which will actually do that grouping for us. And finally, we just need to find the convex holes of those connected components. Um, and within those convex holes, that's going to give us the boundaries of our different clusters. So if we take a look at our data, uh, we can see here that we have latitude, longitude, the amount of the transaction, and the user ID. And as a data scientist, I don't need to have full access to personally identifiable information. So Unity Catalog is really filtering that out for me and making sure I can only see the information that I actually need. So moving on, the next thing uh, which we mentioned to do is actually start to grouping things together. So you can see in this example that we're actually making use of the H3 uh, functions that are built into Databricks. So you don't need to bring in any extra tools or integrate other tools. We can use everything that's already there. And if we look at the groupings that we've produced, we've essentially seen that in, in these different tiles, we have quite a few different transactions here. But at the other end of the scale, we only have you know, one transaction in certain tiles. So we can actually visualize this. It's maybe it's a bit more intuitive if we plot it on a heat map. So using the heat map, we can already see intuitively that there are some areas with more transactions than others. And you know, as a human, we can identify certain clusters in the data. But what we want to do is train a model to do this automatically. Um, and so that's exactly what the, the GeoScan model is doing. And we can see here that we're running it with two, uh, two hyperparameters, one which is the epsilon, the, the distance between the different points and then also the minimum number of points that we need to for a cluster. So I've run this ahead of time, um, and it actually logged a flow in, oh, it logged a, a run in MLflow. Um, and as data scientist, this is really convenient for me because it's a way to structure my work. It's a way to keep track of what experiments I've been running and so on and so forth. But from a compliance perspective, it's also really useful because when we're trying to um, you know, trace the life cycle of a model and answer compliance questions like, why did a model make a particular decision? This really, really helps us to answer those questions and have full traceability over the model's lifecycle. So if we take a look at the output of the model, we generated some GeoJSON, we can actually plot that on top of the heat map. And you can see with these red lines where we started to detect automatically the clusters in the data which we'd already seen kind of intuitively ourselves. Um, to start to get some more intuition here, we can even adjust the hyperparameters. So I've, I've cut them in half just to see what happens. And this has also been logged as a run into MLflow as well. So we're keeping track of all of our experiments. And if we plot that on top of the other uh, heat map, we can see that by reducing those hyperparameters, we've actually tightened up uh, the decision boundary around those clusters a bit more. But of course, this is just one, uh, one part of the data, right? We've actually looked at the whole data set together as, as a unified whole. To, to make this really, really accurate and helpful, we want to personalize this uh, for individual users. So with MLflow, it take, it's very easy to actually take this one model and then retrain it uh, for every single user that we have. This could be millions of users, um, but we have the capability uh, to do this very easily. And using the flexibility of cloud computing, um, it's actually quite cost effective to do that. So with this, we're actually able to produce a, a geometry for every single user. And you can see in this very uh, simple visualization how for each different user, we actually have a different, uh, a different geometry for them. So wrapping up, um, you know, we've been able to go from a very crude basis of you know, uh, transactions occurring in different countries down to actually very localized um, locations of the, of the transactions taking place. Um, the data governance provided by Unity Catalog has ensured that the sensitive customer data is only access accessible by uh, the users who have access to it. Um, 
we've had complete vis visibility of the model lifecycle from end to end, which is really great for compliance. Um, and finally, we're able to do all of this on one platform, which really, really helps the collaboration between different users. So that's all from me. I'll hand back to you, Eric, just to, to wrap us up. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Uh, so to summarize, uh, the winners in the financial sector will be data and AI companies. And what categorizes them, or what you will see with them, is that they are intensely focused on value, not technology, but on value. They build capabilities that allow them to run fast in a heavily regulatory environment. And thirdly, they engage the ecosystem. They engage their partners, their vendors, and they demand skin, skin the game from them in their common journey. And uh, I want to put this, it's important that we also build something that is, is fun for the users, right? Where the engineers and the scientists in our organizations are enjoying working in. So don't forget that part. Thank you. Thank you, Eric and Joshua. Excellent that you could share your viewpoints on what is happening and ongoing in the finances market, and especially like the enjoy the fun part here. You need to have fun. But what would be, Eric, your, your recommendation for the companies who are now starting their journey towards to become a winner in this, in this game? That's a good question. I think, first of all, there's, there's a lot that has been done in this space, right? So my, my recommendation would be to not try to reinvent the wheel again. Look to your partners, bring in an outside-in perspective. Make sure that you start out small, you get started, and then you scale up and you get the organization to come along with you. So you bring that change management aspect into it as well. Thank you, Leda Bricks. Now we are approaching towards the end of our, our uh, breakout session. Last but not least, we have selected the topic of sustainability. The ESG regulation is increasing, new directives and regulations are, are coming into force. And we at Capgemini have a navigation tool for you. Now I would like us to listen Martin von Streich, who is going to present our ESG lens to you. Hi there, my name is Martin von Streich. I'm part of Capgemini Invent, where I focus on data, sustainability and innovation for financial services. Today, I'd like to tell you about Capgemini's ESG Land solution. Before we go into the solution, let's first look at the key sustainability needs for financial services. This image shows the key needs on the left-hand side, which include regulatory compliance. The regulatory landscape is rapidly evolving. New stringent ESG reporting regulations are being introduced that involve requirements to report about for example, financed emissions and include an audit requirement. Secondly, risk management. Easy factors need to be factored into risk management and financial institutions like banks need to perform and report on their climate stress tests. Thirdly, product and service innovation. Product and service innovation is required to support the sustainability transition and offers a great business opportunity. On the right hand side, we see the key challenges associated with these needs. These in involve increased regulatory burden. It requires a lot of effort to adhere to the evolving ESG reporting requirements. There is effort required for interpretation, understanding the unique data points that need to be reported on, and consolidating the data in an efficient, auditable manner. Secondly, data quality and availability. Data is often fragmented and siloed and does not meet expectations and requirements related to data quality. Also, data may not be easily available or even missing completely. And finally, lack of expertise and resources. Clearly defining the business needs, translating them into data requirements and designing the processes and systems to manage the data efficiently requires resources with expertise those resources are scarce. If we look at it from a business use case perspective, then I'd like to use this iceberg picture to explain that the number of business use cases is rapidly evolving. All these use cases require trusted data, often overlapping data. Under the surface is where the heavy lifting happens. Data needs to be consolidated from many different sources. Data trust needs to be ensured 
and transparency and lineage needs to be provided to ensure auditability of the data. To help clients resolve the mentioned challenges, we have developed our ESG Lens solution. ESG Lens consists of solution components to help identify data needs based on regulatory requirements and ESG reporting frameworks, define data sourcing for those requirements, and leverage the data for insights and reporting. Let's dive into the demo of the Capgemini ESG RegLens solution. Do note that the demo environment contains sample data. ESG RegLens supports the end-to-end -end flow from interpreting the various ESG reporting regulations to analyze overlap between regulations, assess the data availability, and remediate data gaps. It has been created based on the experience we have gained helping clients prepare their ESG reporting. Let's run through the process. It starts with interpreting different ESG regulations by seeing which regulations are relevant for a specific region or jurisdiction. You can do this by selecting a country on the map. A table will occur with the list of different regulations. You can select one to see its definition. Then from the right hand list, I can make a selection, go to the bottom table, select the regulations I'm interested in, and press View Selected. Now I can see the scope, the summary, and the conditions, as well as the timeline for this regulation, how it evolved, and the latest information and updates that have occurred. For my list, I can save and I can set an email alert to receive updates whenever there's changes performed on the regulation. Then we move on to analyze. In this section, I can review the metrics under the selected regulations and compare it against another regulation to evaluate the interoperability. We can scan through all the different metrics and their definitions. We can have a view on the structure of the regulation, and there is a heat map that shows the overlap between the different regulations. In the next step, we can assess the data availability on a regulation to understand the data gaps. To do this, we can navigate through the list of metrics and select the data availability, priority, and data source. We can make comments as well. Once we've done this, we get a percent indicator on data availability. Once we know our data gaps, we can evaluate how our data vendors will be able to help us remediate the data gaps. In this table, I see an overview of the selected data vendors and criteria in terms of data quality and data coverage. I can also navigate through the data that a vendor has available to understand how it can help remediate a data gap. And as a final step, I have a complete overview of the regulation that I have selected, the coverage under the regulation, data availability, and the data sourcing. This was a quick demonstration of our EEG Lens solution. Feel free to contact me or my colleagues if you'd like to learn more. The solution can be tailored to meet your specific needs. 
and it will help you reduce time and manual effort. Thank you very much for your time and attention and have a great rest of your day. Bye bye. Today we have had interesting, exciting stories about Make It Real. We started the session by having a generative AI examples in the banking world. Then we continued how to move from the old world to new world by using the data products and data mess uh, ideas. After that, we had a session by uh, Databricks, how to make the winning formula by combining data, AI and technology. And on top of that, we saw the demonstration of fraud detection. The last but not least was our sustainability topic, ESG Lens. That is a tool that helps you to navigate in the ESG regulation framework. I thank you for your participation today. This is now the end of the breakout, but there is more to come. Please join our main event with the moderators Rosa Santi and Thomas Swan, who will summarize the event. Back to the studio and thank you.